Hi, my name is Noah Gift and I'm the author of Python for DevOps. And this course is going to talk to you about some of the key principles for DevOps that are important. These key principles include how to deal with the file system, how to set up continue, continuous integration, how to build command line tools that help you automate your workflow, and then how to turn things into microservices that you continuously deploy on the AWS platform. So really this is a, from the beginning to the end, uh, key skills seminar on how to actually accomplish real world tasks with Python for DevOps. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Cool about GitHub is that there are all of these emerging tools that I think you'll see in, in a little bit that are, are really pretty amazing actually for, for doing uh, software engineering, for doing uh, DevOps best practices, and we're going to step by step use some of those tools to to build things out. So, uh, in this repo, I'm going to put in uh, all of the tools for for building uh, DevOps workflows, and then I'm going to make this public so that everybody else can get access to it. I'm going to add a README file right here, and then I'm going to go through here and and put in also a, a license. This is typically the style that I do is is uh, put a git ignore, put a license file, and then uh, create a repo. So so this will be the the main repo uh, that I use, and I'll, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put this in uh, as a share so that other people <clears throat> can get access to it. There we go. And so what's the first thing that a DevOps engineer should do when they're building out a structure? I would say the the first thing that a DevOps engineer should do is is create the scaffolding right and and the scaffolding for a project uh, is best done in some kind of a development environment and there are a couple different choices for a devops engineer if you're going to use cloud-based development environments one of them is actually uh, github code spaces so i'm going to start with that and i'll show you how this works <clears throat> is that if you go to code here and you have code spaces enabled you can see what it says. It says, welcome to cloud editing, edit, debug, and run your repository without local cloning uh, and setup. So the advantage of this from a DevOps perspective is that you don't have to worry about everybody in your team having slightly different environments. And additionally, you don't have to worry about the bandwidth between where you're developing and between the cloud environment that you're deploying to or the data center that you're deploying to, you're all located in a high bandwidth environment. Additionally, you can toggle on potentially more powerful machines than you typically have access to. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. If I go to create code space here and I select this, notice that the default is okay, but I can configure advanced uh, code spaces as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and configure an advanced one. And let's look at some of the options that are available. One. We have a two core machine, uh, uh, we have a four core machine, uh, eight core machine, 16 core machine. So this one, 16 core machine, 32 gigs of RAM and uh, 128 gigs of storage. I think for most software engineers, DevOps engineers, this is perfect, right? This would be a great environment to to, to build uh, things inside of. The, the six core machine, right, a, a one GPU machine with 112 <coughs> gigs of RAM, for example, uh, this would also be a great environment for building uh, MLOps style uh, workflows because you could also tune it, uh, tune, let's say, pre-trained models or, or machine learning systems directly uh, on this cloud-based environment. So there's, depending on what workflow you're in, you're more DevOps-centric or more MLOps-centric, you actually have options for, for all those. And I think we'll, we'll be able to cover many of those uh, today. I'm gonna start with this one, which is the, the 16 core environment with 32 gigs of RAM. So I'm gonna go ahead and select this and then say create uh, code space. And you can see here that once you've got this created, uh, it's, it's pretty nice because uh, now I can do all of my work inside of here. I don't have to worry about what packages were installed on my machine or you know other, other weird things that crop up in, in a project. So I'll give this a second to uh, launch. Okay, so image found, 
container built. It takes a second for it to find the correct uh, image, and then it takes it and it builds out a container. And then once the container is built, we can actually go through and connect to this environment. Now, I'm going to show a couple options here that are that are pretty interesting with uh, GitHub Code Spaces uh, that are, are, are pretty cool. And one of them is that you can actually set up something called pre-build. And what pre-build does is it allows the, the environment to be uh, periodically pre-built based on uh, some criteria that you set, which makes this process of starting uh, actually much, much quicker. So you could actually customize this for your, your organization, have a bunch of different things inside of your container. And then as soon as you're ready to go, it would actually go through here and uh, pre-build this environment. So I'll give this just a second here to, to kind of wake up here. In fact, I guess, well, oh, there we go. So we're, 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 we're woken up. The, the first thing that I, that I would actually do when I would start out in this environment is just tweak the look and feel a little bit. So one of the things that I do is I go through here, I say color theme, and I go to, uh, I like personally the, the dark Visual Studio Code, but there's actually a lot of um, different color themes that you can pick. The other one I kind of like too is this uh, dark colorblind beta. Uh, because it uh, actually has a little bit sharper colors and also it's uh, it, it's good for uh, accessibility. So there's less chance that uh, everybody that, that views it would have an issue with it. Now, once I've got this set up, the, the first thing that I typically would want to do is go to terminal and make sure I have a terminal and, and kind of take a look at things. Now, a, a few things that I'll point out in this cloud-based de development environment that are, that are interesting are that one... If you go to um, the command prompt, which is uh, shift command P, it gives you a prompt of different actions that you can do to, to tweak things a little bit. And one of the things that is a really good starting point before you even do anything or any coding is to make a decision about what kind of environment uh, that you actually wanna build. And so there's a feature called dev containers. And we go here, we say code spaces add development container configuration files right here. And if I select this, what it's gonna do is it's gonna prompt me to actually go through here and ask what kind of container I'd like to build. So this is really invaluable for a DevOps workflow because it allows you to pick the, the exact kind of environment that is important. So Alpine, Debian, Ubuntu, you know, et cetera. Uh, if I select um, show all containers, you can see here that it even gives me options for advanced things like Docker from Docker, Kubernetes, Ubuntu, uh, Ansible, uh, Azure CLI, Azure Terraform, Bash, Chef Workstation, Clojure, GitHub Code Spaces, C++, Dart, you know, Elixir, Go, Haskell, Hugo. I mean, a, a wide variety of different environments, PowerShell, uh, Python 3. Right, so it's it's up to you as a DevOps engineer to, to, to maybe work with your organization to start up uh, a particular environment that would have all the things that are, are good. Like here's another one, Azure Machine Learning, right? Uh, maybe that's a, a machine learning environment you wanna set up, uh, Anaconda. Uh, so th there's a huge variety of, 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 of things that, that you could actually go ahead and, and set up here. And I think there's a default here, which if I just go through and I say default, or, or GitHub, yeah, here we go, GitHub code space default. If I just select that, that's, that's the one I'm in now, it'll give me these container files. And so what's, what's neat about this is that it'll even ask me, oh, look, you know, you've you made a change. You know, it, should, should you go through and, and, uh, and rebuild the container? We don't have to do that right now, but what I will point out is that you can go through here and look at the configuration and, and see what, is that, what it is that GitHub gives you by default when you set up a code space environment. In this case, we can see it's got linting enabled. It's got, so it's in a sense, it's a, it's a best practices guide that you can use to set up your project and, and really some good stuff in here. Now, the, the parts that I think are, are, are really uh, important to be aware of as well is that you can go to Docker. Notice it creates a dev container file and it creates a Docker file. And one of the things that you can do is, is it'll, it'll start to prompt you for extensions uh, as well. And so if I, if I go through here and I say 
it says, do you want to install the recommended extension? Sure, let's go ahead and do that. It'll start to put all of these extensions for the kinds of projects that I'm working on and including Docker files. Now, the other part of the configuration for dev container that's important is that if I go through here and I look at the codes, the extensions that are installed, it only has one for Docker currently, but I also could type in Python and look, it could say IntelliSense. So we, if we want to install uh, IntelliSense for Python, sure, I want to do that. That sounds great. Let's go ahead and do that. And I can start to customize the environment and actually build a standardized uh, development environment that I could share with other people. So let's let's customize this a little bit. So I'm going to start off with here, uh, add the Python environments. I'm also going to type in something called Copilot, which we're going to use extensively. And what does Copilot do? So Copilot allows me to actually get suggestions that are a little more advanced than a traditional code editor. In fact, in many cases, it'll actually let me write uh, full functions uh, inside of uh, the, the Copilot ecosystem. So really it's an AI pair programmer that's sitting there and actually writing code with me. So let's go here. Let's say GitHub Copilot nightly install. There we go. GitHub Copilot labs uh, install, right? So we, we in, in both cases, we're able to actually put these Copilot uh, labs and the Copilot pair programmer inside. And what this is going to do so I do a couple different things. One, it's going to get give me suggestions. And then two, I think if I go to the labs here, where is this Copilot Labs, you can also write uh, language explanations and you can also translate things from a different language. So these are just more tools that allow me to be successful when I'm when I'm going through and I'm and I'm building projects. So now that I've got this uh, customized, if I go back here, I can right click on this and I can say add to dev container. I can also, uh, or actually I don't want that one. I'm gonna go back to the dev container real quick, the Explorer, and you can see all the different extensions. So I don't want that one. I'm gonna delete that one. And I'm gonna go back to the extensions and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick the ones I've already got installed. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna say, um, add to dev container and I'm gonna pick this one and I'm gonna say add to dev, add to dev container. So, so what we could do is we could just look at the installed e extensions and I could make sure that each of these is actually put inside. So let's do that. Let's just go through here. We'll say add to dev container. We'll, we'll add this. We'll say add to dev container. We'll, we'll do this. We'll say add to dev container, uh, add to dev container. And then this last couple, we'll, we'll do that as well. We'll say add dev container, add the dev container. Perfect. Uh, okay, so now that I've got all these set up, if we go back here and we say dev container, look at this, we have uh, uh, several different extensions that have been added to this. So, so why does this help me? Well, this means that I can get the exact environment and share it with other people that I work with. So that's really a huge takeaway. Before I even write any code, I've got a uniform environment. So how would we actually uh, rebuild this thing? Well, there's a couple ways to get this cooking. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in git status like this, and I'm gonna say git add dot dev container, just like that. And what's nice about this is that it will actually add, check this into uh, source code. Now, another thing that we could do if we wanna be a little bit fancy is we also could could set up some kind of an automated way to create a, a virtual environment. And I do have an example of that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to another environment here and take a look uh, at, at another recipe I have, which I think is in um, Assimilate Python. Uh, and if I look at another dev container, I can get some ideas. So I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna look at one of my dev containers here. And one of the things that I did, was it this one? No, or was it uh, my AWS one actually? Let's go to, assimilate AWS, 
in this organization. Let's do this one. So you can look at other things that you've done and you can get ideas from it or, or other people on your team could get other ideas and, and we can find one where I, here we go. This is the command I'm looking for. So I could say, look, use a post create command to run the commands after a container is created. So in this case, I could say, look, I want you to uh, create a virtual environment inside of my container. I want you to then throw the configuration to the bash RC file. Uh, and then I want you to run make install every single time. So let's try that. That sounds like a, a good thing to to play around with. So if I go back here to my dev container, I can go to this um, file and I can actually, uh, I, if I want to, I can actually swap it out uh, directly inside of here and, and make a, make a, uh, a change here. So it's, it's really up to me whether I want to use the, the their default build here or if I wanted to, I'll just put a comment here. I could put in some some new command to to swap out uh, my container. And one of the things that that I can do as well is um, notice that there's a virtual environment that's already built in here. Uh, if I want, uh, I could if I say ls dash la, you I could I could do some kind of automation with what's art which already customized so it's really up to me to to decide what it is i want to do when i'm when i'm initially building this container for for now though i'm going to uh just leave the defaults not not get too crazy here i'm going to say get status uh add this dot dev container and i'm going to commit it adding dev container there we go and we're going to go ahead and and push this so now that it's now that it's pushed if I go back to my repository, if I say here, go to repository, what we can do is we can go to code and and we could we could potentially configure this uh, in a in a different way. So if I go to my um, my settings here for this project, one of the things that we can do is we go to code spaces and it has this concept of setup prebuild. And so what does setup prebuild do? This would pre-build everything that's already inside of that environment for me so it launches quickly. So everybody that was on my team in my DevOps project could, could set up the, the pre-build and I could I would just need to put some parameters. So here we go. What What is the actual branch? And then what is the configuration file? In this case, dev container uh, slash dev container JSON. Every push that, that I wanna make to it, go through and uh, and and rebuild this in environment for me. So now that I've done that, I just say go ahead and create. So what this is going to do is it's going to already bake up this environment. So this is an amazing uh, concept: is pre-baking environments so that everything is set up in the way I want. Uh, and again, for everybody on my team that's doing DevOps with me, they each could do something very similar uh, and, and get all this stuff set up. So now that I've I've got this. Really, I'm I'm ready to develop, and it's up to me to decide what kind of workflow that I want to set up and how quickly I want to launch things. But in general, the next step that I would recommend would be to to now now that I've got that set up is to create a scaffold for the project. And so, what I would describe as a as a, a scaffold would be a make file, some requirements file. Uh, and potentially a virtual environment, you know, which is depending on what kind of package manager system you use would be important. So I'm going to go ahead and create those. So I'm going to say touch make file right here. And I'm going to say touch re requirements file like that, right? So we have a requirements file, we have a make file. And then what I can do in these, uh, in this setup here is I can copy and paste those those uh, commands from again some other project that I've already got set up. So here's a good one. I've got this uh, this uh, other AWS project. I'm going to go to the requirements. I'm going to grab some of the stuff and, and tweak it a little bit. So here we go. I've got I've got this, and we'll say uh, Boto three. Now I don't need that. That's a the Python SDK, but uh, PyLint, Click, PyTest, Cove, Fast API. I think we just care about probably these for, for right now. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe the Ubicorn uh, as well, which is to allow us to make microservices. Now that I've got that set up, I can also go back here 
and I can look at the um, the make file. And if we go to the make file here, I can just go through here and I can also paste this in. Perfect. There we go. And if I wanted to, again, I could also put more extensions into this project that says, oh, look, you're working with make files. Do you want to use a dev container extension? Sure, let's go ahead and do it. So if I, if I go through here and uh, I, I then right click, I can say add to dev container extension. Perfect. And, 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 then, and then if I go back here, if I say get status, notice that it's now making those modifications. So every change, which is a very unique part of building inside of a cloud-based environment, is actually being uh, kept track of inside of this dev container. So it's kind of keeping track of the state of my container, which, which is a really new concept for, for DevOps and for software engineering, but I think a very important one. And if I go through here, I just say, I just keep adding it, right? I just keep adding stuff inside. Uh, and then I can tweak a make file a little bit for my project. So I like to do a make install so that every time uh, I, I install something, it's, it's uniform. And then uh, we could have a test here. Uh, we could also do a format. And then we could put in different linting uh, patterns. In this case, I don't have any AWS tools, so I can delete that out. Uh, and so I typically do this. I say make refactor, which is formatting my code and linting my code. Uh, and then the only other thing that I could do is I could create a virtual environment, which you know it depends on what you're you're doing, but I like to use a virtual environment. So I'm going to say virtual env tilde dot venv, and uh, I'm going to then uh, echo that into into my um, into my bash rc. And in fact, uh, there's a couple ways that we could do this. If I look at the dev container, we could even do something like this we could say echo right like I, I i could actually probably just throw this command um activate we could we could probably post command. oh i see tilde this this one we could probably take we could probably take this this um this looks a, a little bit messed up here. If I, if I delete this a little bit, it would be a virtual environment, create a virtual environment. That's what we want. We want something, and then we would want to source this source. So I, I could just do this, something like this afterwards. And I could put this into my build script. If I, uh, and, so, and sometimes you can, it's a, it can be a little bit tricky to get things uh, perfect here, um, but I could I could put that inside of there. I won't do it today, but you could you could tweak this so that you would you would automatically do this step uh, every time you do a build. For now, though, I'm just going to do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna put in this uh, echo echo command, which will which will uh, allow me to to put that into the Bash RC. So let's let's go ahead and uh, allow right here so i say echo source um that command is actually incorrect this would be source uh, tilde slash dot vmv bin activate like that there we go so we would we would source this so we'd say source tilde slash dot vmv bin activate and we just say basically put that command in inside um, of that bash RC file. And then if I, if I tail it and I say dot bash RC, we should see that in there and we see that's in fact in there, right? So you do something like that. And then uh, what happens is every time the bash RC is started, if I say source tilde bash RC, there we go. Our virtual environment is loaded. So, so some kind of configuration there that again, you would just need to, I could even put a comment here that says, you know, tweak this if needed, right? If, if you like virtual environments, not everybody uses virtual environments. I like, to, I like to use virtual environments. But once I do have that set up, then all I need to do is just type in make install like this. And this is really the beginning of, of creating a project, right? As you, you go through here 
and I'm going to install all these packages. Let's try it out and let's just do a make install. Perfect. So now that I've done a make install, then uh, I'm actually ready to start building out a structure, building out code, building out examples. And so I have essentially the whole DevOps ecosystem. So what, what would be the first thing that I do when I start off with a, a project? I would say get a little bit of code working and then get continuous integration working with that code. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a file called hello.py, just like this. And once I've got this hello file created, then what I can do is actually build out uh, a function inside. And this is where the copilot uh, comes into play, which is which is pretty amazing tool, is I could actually ask it to do something for me. So I could say, look, um, you know, build an add function for me. There we go. And it's gonna actually write the code for me. And then uh, I could actually say, build a subtract function. There we go, build a subtract function. And so we have this pair programmer writing with me. And now what I can do is I can say, sure, let's build a multiply function as well. And, and then uh, maybe let's do a divide, right? So we have a little calculator here. And now we'll say, uh, build a main function to call it. Uh, and, and this main function could call, you know, each of these, each of these pieces of functionality uh, when I run it. And I would say to start with though, just to make things simple, I'm just gonna call one of them. So I'm gonna say, if, uh, if uh, under, under name is equal to main, uh, and then I can put some kind of a, uh, in fact, it gave me a suggestion. It gave me a su suggestion. It says, hey, I'm gonna use a calculator function. Sure, let's, I'll, I'll use your suggestion, right? Cause I don't care, I'm just making sample code. And so, uh, the only other thing I would do is put a shebang line up here, which allows it to be a script. V Python like that. Make it executable. There you go. Perfect. I'm going to use a calculator function to multiply 5 and 6. Uh, 30. Perfect. And what, what's great about it is that... Um, that now that I've got this structure set up, that I can actually go through here and and start to set up some kind of a test structure as well. And this is also something that is pretty useful for the uh, the Copilot ecosystem, my my pair programmer. So I'm going to go ahead and create a, a test file. So we'll call this test hello, like this. And and what I can do is just import the code from here. So I'm going to say from hello imports uh, from hello import actually add subtract multiply divide so so add all these in and and what's cool about copilot especially for things like tests is it essentially writes the code for me so it's it's basically going to give me a very good suggestion so i'm going to say test add yeah it's ex that's right there we go thanks write a <laughs> write a write a uh, an add test for me. So if I if I put three and five into this, right? If I go through here and I say three and five into this, perfect. It gives me that suggestion. Next up, what what do I want to do? In fact, I can just prompt it. So I can give it some suggestions. I can say build a test uh, for subtract. There we go. And now build a test for subtract. Build a test for multiply. There we go. And then build a test for divide. There we go, right? So it, it allows me to write boilerplate code very, very quickly, which again is going to be great for a DevOps engineer because your test code has been written much, much quicker, right? And so this is this is a, a huge advantage. And I think most DevOps engineers should embrace all forms of automation because all forms of automation allow you to build things uh, very, very quickly. So uh, if, if we say get, status here and I say get add dot dev container we can we can add all this stuff in uh, as we're as we're building it we'll go ahead and add the structure and we'll say um, built hello world calculator and test 
So, so how do we test this? Well, if I go back to the make file here, look at this. I've got a lint and I have a test here. I'm going to uncomment the test and we can see that basically the PyTest framework will look for anything that has test and a wildcard, which this would match right here. So I can say here, make test. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. Make test. Perfect. We have all of our tests are actually passing here. Now, if I want to, I also could add a, a coverage, which I think is Py, which would be cov equals um, hello. And let's see what happens now. Does it show me the test coverage? Uh, cov equals, let's, let me look at uh, um, PyTest cov syntax, PyTest cov coverage syntax. And it'll show me, uh, I want to run cov. What does it say to do? It says dash s yes, cov. So let's, let's double check dash s yes, cov is what I need to do. So did I do that? I said dash s yes, cov hello. And let's, we can get rid of this statement. File or directory not found. Let's make sure that it's installed. I did install it. So I don't know why that's, um, why that's not actually working, not implemented yet. No, Python test, dash cov equals hello. Error file or directory not found. Oh, I didn't do dash dash. Is that what I messed up? Did I, did I not do that uh, dash dash cov? There we go. Perfect. And now it shows me that I have 75% test coverage in that application and I have the, the passing test. So we, we're, we're in pretty good shape. What if I run make lint? This should look for linting, right? And, and the reason you do linting is that it, it catches weird bugs. Like let's say that I was distracted for a second and I just put in some weird code like var equals one, var equals var, or something, something like this. Like it's, it's syntactically correct, but it will cause problems in the future. If I say make lint, uh-oh, assigning the same variable var to itself uh, is, is a problem, right? There we go, var equal to one, var is equal to var, perfect. Now, it, it caught that bug, and so I can actually just, uh, I don't have to, to leave it in there, but we can, we can come back to that later. And the only other thing really to set up would be to also check the formatting, which I think is a good part of your life cycle, would be to format your code and lint your code Right, and so if, if I say make format as well, uh, we can see that uh, we need to fix the format, which is this. There we go. So just basically run it, run run my 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 format. I guess I could also tell it to format the uh, the test code, or, or every every code. Right, we can just say that. We can just say run it, run it on on everything. Uh, I think we can do this. Let's try that. Uh, we probably, there we go, it reformatted. So you, so you can, you have to play around a little bit with the wildcards to, to get exactly what it is that you want. But in this case, it's gonna reformat anything that's got an asterisk in the, just a current working directory. Uh, some tools will recurse automatically. So I wasn't sure if it did it, but this is a great, you know, software engineering best practice, right, is to get the 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 process of formatting your code, testing your code, linting your code, all running, you know, periodically. So now that I've got this, uh, basically, I, I have I could do an all step, which what we could do is we could say install lint test and format, and later if I wanted to do a deploy, which which we could get to potentially, is if I said deploy. The deploy would go here and it could be, you know, echo deploy, you know, deploy goes here, right? Some, something like that. And then, and then the deploy would be the final step, right? Is that it, we would, we would lint our code, format our code, refactor it, all this, all this, all these quality control steps. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to say get status. I'm going to say get add, make file, get add, hello get add test 
and we can go ahead and say um, initial project structure and we've got uh, a great project structure set up the, the the next step then would be to get the continuous integration uh, environment set up and uh, fortunately it's pretty easy to do that if i go to here and i go to repository what we can do is we can go to github actions here and we can set up uh, a continuous integration run now notice it's always going to be pre-building the environment which is great so that's one thing that we've controlled but we also want to control the the um the the deployment of our of our software and so uh, i think i also or, or that we want to test the integration testing in the environment that we've set up and so uh, what we can do here is um is if we want to start off with this is we can just get like a kind of a, a basic workflow here and we could just we could just tweak this uh step by step and build it so uh let's let's go ahead and um grab this a little bit so controls when the workflow will run right so we can just take out some of the comments if we want to and it says triggers the workflow and pull pull or push that looks good a workflow is made up of jobs that run sequentially or in parallel we can get rid of that comments um, and we can just kind of clean this up a little bit so that i can i can use it uh, we can get rid of that comment we can get rid of that comment just to make it more on the screen here. And uh, this is going to run on Ubuntu latest, which is similar to our build. And then and then we could again just pull out some of these comments and and put put our code inside of here. So the first thing is it says checks out your repo uh, under GitHub workspaces. Great. Runs uh, a single line code. Perfect. Run, echo run a, a one line script so what we're going to say is we're going to say basically um uh make install so we'll say you know uh, install packages like that and and all we need to do is actually just type in make install right so we can put each of these steps that we've already done in our environment inside of this particular process and so what i can do here is uh is actually step by step do do the same thing so really it would be it would be the name would be the the part that i would reuse over and over again so i, I would just add several steps that would use that that name functionality there we go so the next thing would be to uh lint and we would say make lint and then i would do the same thing i would just copy this this line again or or indent it or whatever I want to do it, it, it in some sense it might be easier to do this in the editor but for now I'm in here we'll do it and I could say test uh, make tests and then I could do this I could say name and we can say format right so it just it'll show me if each of these steps is actually successful which are all quality control steps and if I say start commit, exactly. And if I go to actions, perfect. Now, the only one that failed was format because that tool appeared to not be installed inside of our environment, which, which is great. Now, let's go ahead and uh, fix this. So I'm going to go to this. I'm going to say create status badge. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to put it inside of this repo right here at the top. There we go. Perfect. And then once we've got that set up, the, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to uh, I'm actually going to um, go back to my environment here and I'm going to say git pull. And we can see all of those files are now inside of here, which are the, the config file. Now, what I what 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 is true is, look, that formatting tool 
it must be in my environment, but it's not actually located inside of here. So we can just type in black. And now if I say type in uh, make install, this will install that tool. And if I want to get really fancy, what I can do is I can pin each of these packages. So what we can do is we can just type in um, pip freeze like this. And I can say um, less. And we can just grab the tools uh, exact uh, numbers. So we can look through here and say fast API. Let's get this one. Let's do uh, what else we got in here. We have um, PyTest, PyTest Cov. Let's get those in here. Let's get the click command line tool inside of here. And uh, let's do PyLint right here. There we go. And let's go to UV corn right here. Perfect. So, so now I've got those pinned and I can say get status. Adding a click. Perfect. Now, now that I've got that set up, it, uh, is what I can do next is go back to this environment and we can we can double check to see if this action is actually running successfully. So this is the, the, the whole point of continuous integration is you get an environment configured, you get the um, testing configured, and then you're constantly going back and forth. This is the foundation of DevOps is the continuous integration cycle uh, to, to make sure that you have quality control. There we go, we're all set up and uh, our tests are actually passing and other people can reproduce this environment this will eventually go to green and they can they can clone it not only the the working code but they can also clone the environment itself because of this dev container setup and i'm going to and i'm going to uh, continue to build out things in this project you can see here that the continuous integration has actually been been passed. Everything's set up. So let's let's actually make this into a more of a real world project. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my environment here. I'm going to and I'm going to restructure my project so that it has a library, and that the the logic is fitting into this library. So this is I think a great idea in general is to start putting your code into into library uh, directions. And so if I go through here and I say, um, we'll call this uh, uh, my lib, like that. And, and what I can do is I can say, um, let's go ahead and uh, put the under under init file in here, which tells Python that this is a location we can look for packages. And then uh, I also need to change around the structure of my project uh, a little bit. And so what I can do is I can I can start to refactor this this kind of logic here because this uh, really is a like a calculator function and so let's go ahead and um, let's let's make a new file called calculate like that <clears throat> and then uh, I can actually grab grab this code here and uh, I can just pull it out and then I can go to the the calculate function. And, and we can actually paste this in like that. There we go. So build an add function, and I could even clean it up a little bit, which is which is probably not a bad idea. Uh, I could take these comments out. We don't need these anymore <clears throat> because it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, and we could put a comment at the top here that says, you know, this is, uh, in fact, a cal calculation calculations uh, library or something like that and and then what I can do is I can go to my make file and I can I can restructure things a little bit because the linting tool and the formatting tool and the test tool should all know about this new structure and so what we can do is um, is we can basically say cover hello and also cover now my lib and for formatting, we can also say my lib uh, asterisk.py. And then for the 
um, for the linting, we can say my lib um, asterisk.py, right? And so now if I if I say uh, make make refactor, right? When I'm refactoring, I typically run these main commands. It says, uh oh, undefined variable multiply, multiply in hello. So we can see that there are some dangling things left behind. And so all I need to do to fix this is it's trivial actually, is I just need to do an import and I'm just gonna say um, from my lib dot calculate import multiply. That's it. And now if I go through here and I say um, make refactor, everything's back back to normal. So it's trivial to, to tweak, tweak code around and put it into a library structure, but it makes it more robust. Uh, and in fact, if I run the tests, if I say make test uh, as well, it's gonna say mostly things are working, although error during collection, oh, cannot import add from hello. So we just need to fix our test as well. So we need to say from um, my lib, uh, dot calculate and now we can double check this there we go we also have our our, our unit tests passed as well and in fact we can see that it, it's a hundred percent test coverage right because we have a one-to-one -one mapping for our code so that's really the next step typically is to start to build out a, a library structure so that you can you can do things in your code now now that we've got everything, we're, we're ready to go. I would say that the next thing to to build out in, inside of a project would be to to start to dive into some some real world scenarios of things that are are important in a project. And so, uh, one of the things that we're going to cover was automating text and file systems. So let's let's build some tools that help us deal with uh, text files, deal with uh, the file system. And so we can say this uh, would be part two, and we can say um, part two, automating text and file system. And so in order to do that, um, we, one of the, the, the tools that's a really good tool for that is, um, is uh, Pathlib. And so let's, let's, let's dive into, into Pathlib. And in particular, I use this all the time to, to do certain things. Uh, a great one to start with is to, to walk the file system. Uh, and so let's go ahead and uh, build a calculation. Let, let's, let's build another library inside of here. So we'll call this one um, uh, mylib, and we'll call this uh, file, file tools, like that. And now that we've got this file tools, we can actually use our uh, co-pilot uh, assistant here to help us build out some, some really cool tools. So the first one I would say is, let's build out a tool that searches the file system and looks for patterns, right? So we can say, you know, build a function that searches uh, the file system for a, for a pattern and ignores uh, uh, ignores patterns. There we go. That are list of ignore patterns. So we're going to do this, and and we can even. So you have to. It's almost like a like a like a child. You have to prompt it, and so we can say use uh, pathlib. So you have to tell it what kind of prompts you want it to actually build out. Um, and so we're going to say import pathlib, import sys. And then it's going gonna, it's gonna to give us some suggestions here for what we need to do. Now, it doesn't mean you have to exactly do uh, what it is that it's, it's telling you to do, but it's, it's a good start to, to find some ideas out. And that's why I find Copilot to be a huge improvement in, in building out code right here. So find files in the file system that match uh, the pattern. Ignore files that match any of the ignore patterns. For path in pathlib.path.cwd.glob pattern, for ignore pattern in ignore patterns, if ignore pattern in string path break, otherwise yield the path. So basically, this is going to find things that match a a certain a certain pattern. So let's say we we know that actually uh, we have Python files, right? So that that's going to be an easy one to test, 
and in fact, uh, what we can do is uh, is we can we can very easily test this out by um, using IPython. And so this is a, a great spot to to use another tool that I like to prototype with. And I'm going to go to requirements, and I'm going to put in IPython right here. Right, and so I'm gonna go ahead and do a make install like that. It's gonna install IPython, and we and we if we want to, we could also put the the version number as well. We could do, uh, and it, now it's it's questionable whether I would want this in all all of my um, deployment stuff, but for now it, it's okay. And, and I'm gonna say pip freeze grep um, IPython. And, and we can get the exact package and just throw it in there. So this is a nice little, um, a, a little technique. In fact, I'll put this in the read. Re, I'll, I'll, I'll put like um, tips here. Like we'll say, a great way to find a package version would be to run this command like this. There we go. Pip freeze grep ipython. Uh, so next up here. What we can do is uh, is actually play around with this this tool and see if it see if it actually works. So I'm going to type in IPython, and I can start to interrogate my library. I can say from my lib dot file tools imports find files. Perfect. And now we can actually uh, look through a, a particular d directory. Now, in this case, though, we we actually have one thing that I'd like to change, which is it's only going to look look in the current working directory. And so, um, what we need to do is we need to tweak this so that it actually will find uh, it, it'll actually take a directory. So, so this is already I discovered something that's like eh, not not exactly what I want. And so, what could we do here? Well. We could we could change this. We could say directory, and then we could we could say like directory equals path lib dot directory, and uh, for path in directory, I think it should be this for path in, and we should be able to get some directory dot glob pattern. There we go. So we just need to tweak it a little bit. And uh, I need to get out and get back in again. So you, you you do have to be careful about what it is you're asking for, because it may not be exactly what you want. So in this case, uh, if I type in um, pwd, we can see that's the directory. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna actually say dir or directory is equal to this. So it just makes the code a little bit more robust to explicitly tell it the directory. Now I would just say find files and I would pass in the directory and then the pattern will say pattern is equal to asterisk.py. And for now we can start with that and we can say um, files and if we type in files here Right, it's giving us a generator object. So what we can do is we can say next files. There we go. So we can just see like these are all of the files that it found. So it looks like it looks like it's actually um, been able to 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 find to to find things uh, inside of this particular fat. Uh, it, it, it was able to find at least a couple different things inside of here, and so. Uh, what we could do is we could actually start to build this into a more robust uh, command line tool. And so the next step that I would probably say would be, let's write a test for it. And in fact, one of the ways that we could write a test would be to um, to, to build out, uh, you know, basically some assumptions. So if we go to um, the uh, the test uh, hello here we can see that this is the uh the test for the hello but but we can also build a test for the file tools and so i'm going to build another one and we'll call it touch uh, test uh, file tools like this 
and and we, we can just say in here um, you know from uh, my lib dot file tools import and we just make sure we got this find files we, we want to find uh, we want to do find files find files and we can sit, write a test that says uh, basically uh, we, we can see what kind of um, we can we can use some some suggestions here which are which are kind of cool Let, let's let's see what it says so, so it says test the find files functions so it says create a list of files to ignore um, create a list of files that should be found create a list of files that should not be found now let's see, is that even a file? No, oh, I guess that uh, kind of list of files that, that should not be found. I guess we could do that. And then we could say create a list of files that should be found. Find files, mylib.py. Create a list of files that should not be found. Not found files. And we say test that the files that should be found are found. So we say for files and files. So it's pretty smart, actually, <laughs> our tool. You do have to actually uh, be, you know, base, basically read the code, right? Because it's, it's like another human is helping write the code for you. Like, in, for example, I needed to import this path lib. So if I, if I run this, if I say make test, what happens? It says that there was one error. Uh, assert failed. Hello. So, so there's a there's a couple couple bugs here. It says for files and files assert found in found files. So in this case, the 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 found files would be list find files my lib. Uh, ignore so so this is kind of a little bit too complex of a test for me actually so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make one a little bit simpler to start with is I'm gonna say um, basically let's let's try well I guess it knew that I it was a little bit too complex ignore patterns we'll, we'll say this uh, and then we'll say assert paths file tools Let's try this one. Assert hello is equal to file tools. So in this case, what we what we care about is that we're giving it a directory. So the directory in this case though would be pathlib.path .path, th that would be this current directory um, that it's that's that it's running into. And that's why it finds the the hello file. So if I go through in here and I say make test, we've got this making a make test working. So so we have at least a, the the start of a test. So if I say get status, we can we can add all this in. Adding uh, test files for search. Right now, a couple things that are that are that look like. Um, that looks like they're they're happening though is that it uh, we we want to build a function that that recursively searches uh, uh, everything though so so we we, we want to we I think we want to change this a little bit because this is only a shallow search like if I if I go back here it's not recursing into the um, the the other directory so. Uh, that works for to start with, but what we actually maybe even start over again, and we say uh, recursively recurse if we uh, find files in a directory matching a pattern, and there we go. And let's see if we can we can build out, uh, we, we, and we can say like uh, use we can say use the uh, um, path lib module and ignore patterns and 
and we can we can just start with this import path lib in fact we can say this recursively find files uh, uh, on the file system and return into a directory and, and we can say use path lib module there we go so we say import path lib and let's see what it, what it can build out so here we go we have recursively find files in a directory for path in directory.glob if path is file if not so we, we have we have another option that we could use as well and we could and we could search out and, and find this out so it really it really depends on what it is that we're trying to do and, and how much we want to test things out. I also could just go back and I could just leave things the way they are. And, uh, and we could say here, we, we could just leave this for now and we could just say it's, it's good enough for, for what we want to do. I, I think just because I'm doing a demo, I think this is good enough. We, 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 we've got things working. So let's move on to another topic. Uh, in terms of a file system, which is can we actually uh, go through and, and find what's inside of a file and, and actually uh, do something with with a file, which is which is uh, pretty pretty common. So I'm going to make another tool here, and what we're going to do is we're going to say build a function uh, that that uh, uh, reads uh, a file and searches for a pattern, right? And so we we can we can do this use the string method to find all the patterns return the line number and the line sure so we can say uh, search file so search a file for a pattern and return the line number and the line there we go and uh, this looks this looks like it's 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 uh, set here and we can we can try this one out so how would I test this one out so I would need uh, in this case, we have a hello file here. That would be a good test case. And I could I could actually look again at this uh, file tool and I could say uh, IPython. Perfect, IPython. And say from my lib .file tools import um, from my lib, my lib dot, dot file tools dot file tools imports search file and so if I gave it a, a path if I just type in pwd and I say this so we can say um, uh, my file is equal to and we put in hello like that We, we could actually put in the search file now. So we can say search file, my file. And then what is the pattern we want to look for? Um, well, we could look for the word, um, let's look inside of here for a certain pattern. I would say um, multiply would be a good one. Let's see, let's see what it what it'll actually give me if I say multiply. And uh, there we go from my calculate import multiply so it did find that now I, I think it's I mean so so it did find it but search for file and return a line number and so basically it's it's kind of a dumb search though so so we need to to fix this a little bit and say search a file for a pattern and return the line number and the line so for line in we can say let's change this and let's say uh, search for and return the line number and a line f uh, find all occurrences of the pattern in a file and return the line number of the line as a list of as a as a as a list of tuples sure and then we use pathlib, use enumerate to get the line number, return a list of tuple. So, so you, you have to be careful with the way it prompts things, but I'm gonna say def, um, find a pattern in a file. So in this case, 
we've got we've got uh, all of these, and we're able to 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 say for write a list comprehension that says basically, you know, find all of the patterns now and 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 give me those patterns. And so now let's let's see if we can slightly tweak this thing a little bit to make it more smart. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna say um, exit, go back into IPython, go to directory, and uh, or or sorry, go to um, to my file, and and we'll, and we'll say my file here, and we can say um, from file tools uh, or from my my lib file tools cert, uh, import search file or no, import um, find pattern in file find pattern in file and and we can say uh, that um, results is equal to uh, find pattern in file and my file and it's, it also wants a, a, a search pattern so we'll we'll say the 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 pattern is going to be multiply there we go and if we say results we have multiple results now uh, which is which is which is pretty nice. We have line one, we have line five, and we actually have line six, right? So, so kind of a cool little little uh, tool here. And so now that I've got this built up, uh, I also can um, can can write a, a little test for it as well. So I'm going to go back to my test file here, and I'm going to say uh, import the other one, find pattern in a file. Let's double check that's the right name. Yeah, find pattern in a file. And then I'm going to say, uh, you know, find pattern in a file. And we can just see what it gives us. Import, import path lib. Let's see if that works. Uh, so insert one fi file, parent, hello, pattern import. We can change the pattern. Pattern is equal to import. There should be, the links should be, um, yeah, the link actually should be, that's a, that's a little bit of a weird test here that we look at. We can go back to um, hello, and there's only one, there's only one import statement, right? So, so it's kind of a weird test that it automatically wrote for us. Uh, I don't I don't know if that's a good one. I would say probably instead we should say that um, pathlib and, and we could we could even do um, we, we, we could say file is equal to pathlib um, let, let's let's have it actually look at the um, the, the, the my the my lib dir and, and we could we could have it um do slash um and put in the the actual file tools here file tools like that and then we could say find patterns and file file or my, my or or my my lib um, file tools, something like something like that, and we could do that, and then the the import pattern. I don't know if that's a good one to search for, but we could look. We could see that we um, we we could just we could look for um, sys maybe. You know, Im or import sys or so something like that. So we could we could do that. We could say um, pattern would be import sys, and there should be one result, uh, something like that, right? We can just make make kind of a silly test, and if I do a make test, there we go, right? We have we we actually have uh, a, a test working for for this. So 
you know, you have to be careful when you're using these autopilot tools, but but they can be really, really helpful uh, to, to boi build boilerplate code. So if I say get status and I say this, we've got all, all this built, it, built up and let's check the build system uh, for GitHub action. So we'll say adding checkpoint. So we go through here and we build this out. I can go back to GitHub here to repository and, and we can actually take a take a look at it. So if I refresh, we should see that in fact we're rebuilding our code again. And um, here's actions, adding checkpoints, perfect, and and we're able to actually build this out. So it's going to go through here and it's going to build these packages. It's going to link these packages. It's going to test format. There we go, lint. Uh, dangerous default value using open. So we found some, we found some problems actually in, in our code that we need that we need to fix. So that's that's one of the beautiful things about using the build system is that I forgot to run lint, and so it found a, a bug. So let's fix it. So if I go back here and I say make lint, we should see some of those issues. Uh oh, dangerous default value. Uh, so let's fix these one by one, and even format we can fix it formatting it as well. So I'm going to go to um, the file tools line eight and let's fix that one first, which it says ignore patterns. And and we can say um, for ignore or ignore patterns, it's true that that could be an issue for ignore, ignore patterns. Um, and so it's up to us to decide how we want to handle this uh it, whether we care about that default or not what we could do is we could say we could actually ignore this for now and so what you could do is this you could say uh, uh, uh pylint ignore right you could say pylint ignore i forget the um the exact pylint syntax it's like pylint disable this right so if i if i do a lint again it just depends on whether we care about that or not we can say yeah we're, we're okay with that for now now the open might be a little bit more of one that we we care about that's on line 27 here using open without explicitly specifying in encoding um we could also say we don't care about that one and we could say um, pylint. We can just say pylint uh, disable, right? So, so it's up, it's up to us whether we whether we care about these or not. We, maybe we do, maybe we don't, but it, it's good to to be explicit about it. And now, if I do this, unused import. Now, this one is a good one, right? We we, we actually don't want to to use this. Now I'm gonna have to change my test because my test is now bad. So I'm gonna have to go back to this and I'm gonna have to say import pathlib. And if I run um, make test, hopefully the tests all work, they do. And if I say make lint, all the lint, linting works. And if I say make format, all the formatting works. So let's go ahead and check these in. So really, DevOps is an iterative process of continuously improving code, changes to fix code, and 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 we're able to actually get basically a, a pretty good structure here. So the probably the what's the last thing to do to get some file system tools working would be now let's make a command line tool, right? Let's make a useful uh, command line tool. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a a tool here called um, um, file file tools CLI right how about that and inside of this file tool CLI we can import some of those tools we built before but we're going to use the click command line tool so I'm going to say import click and then I'm going to say uh, import or, and then I'm going to say from my lib dot um, file tools 
I'm going to import both of these, right? Because we're, we're going to use both of these tools. And so now I'm going to say, I'm going to create a click group, which, so it's, it's almost in a sense like reading your mind. Uh, and, and, and basically we're going to now build out some, some things that, that, that basically search the file system. So we, we say, we're going to build a command called, um, this one will be, um, we'll call this one search. And it's going to look for um, a directory. It's going to look for a pattern. It's going to uh, ignore patterns. Uh, and here we go. And, and I can even put some documentation here. Searches for files in a directory that match a pattern. And so we can actually um, put an example as well. And this is one of the cool things that 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 you get from Copilot is we can say like we can basically tell it to to help us build an example and so in this case we say let's uh what would an example of this tool look like and and again you have to kind of prompt it so you have to know what you're doing you can't just you can't just um uh completely uh you know ig ignore how it works but in this case we we can say file tools um in this case ignore patterns and we, and we would say, there we go, default, multiple equals true. Okay, let's try this out. So let, let's let's now make this in a, um, have a shebang line right here. So user bin env python. And then at the bottom, we would go here and we would say, uh, if, let's call this out. So, so this is what's kind of cool too, is that, um, it it it, it, uh, well, it really does a lot of the boilerplate code for you. And so now it's essentially ready to go. I just need to chmod it and let's run this. So file tools, CLI. Okay, how do we, how do we build out uh, this tool? We can first start with help. There we go, a command line interface for the, the file, tool, file tools module search. So search for files in a directory that, uh, that match up a, a pattern. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to say search the the current working directory. So so actually why don't we just run the run the thing it told me to run, right? So let's let's try it out. If we go through here and we and we go like this. There we go. It found file tools CLI and it found hello, right? So so pretty pretty neat little tool here. Uh and it looks to be working. What if I look at my lib? What if I say here Let's search for uh, my lib and let's have it find, uh, f let's see, my lib, I believe, I, oh, it's imlib. Yeah, that's not the wrong, right one. We want to do my lib. Let's search for my lib, my lib. There we go. I found my lib init, calculate file tools, right? So we have a nice little, uh, search tool here at least a, a shallow search tool it doesn't recursively search the the file system now w can we do things that make this even fancier yeah so one of the things that we can do is we can actually add some color output to it which i think is a pretty good idea for a tool and so what we can do instead is we can say use click colors to print the path and so uh, command use click colors to highlight the pattern uh, in the file path. There we go. And now let's try it. Let's try it and see if it's it's changing. There we go. Right. So we we see that actually it was able to add uh, a, a new color. Uh, and what we could do as well is. We, we could um, maybe add like a count of, of files that it, it, it found. And so we could say like, you know, uh, you know, create a count of files found, count, loop through the files found. And uh, right, so we could say, this so we we have let's see here 
loop through. So we would we would probably want to tweak this a little bit. And we would we would just say like files like that. And we would say files. And we would say um for files and files uh, increment the count and, and the, but in this case we we actually don't want to do that we just want to count it right so you, you have to be careful about about listening to our tool here and, and we, but we could say like you know print the number of files found but using uh, a click color All right so you have to you have to really kind of prompt this thing uh, you know to 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 do the to, to do the right thing and uh, and now if we go through here three files found and for fast click echo don't know why it didn't print the files though. Oh, because uh, to highlight the path. Uh, let's see what, what we get here. Print the number of files found and now prints all of the files found. Uh, so, so what we could do is we could, we could print all the files found with a uh, click color different than the count. There we go. And we could even tweak it. Yeah, perfect. That looks pretty good. Now, why is it not printing out these files for file and files? I think because it's consuming the 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 files. So what we need to do is we need to tweak this a little bit. I think we need to put this up there and then we can we can tweak it a little bit. Let's try that. There we go. Yeah, I think it's because it's a generator it already consumed the the list. There we go. Three files found, right? So, I mean, good good enough. And now what we can do is we can we can say um, make refactor, make sure that our code is is working. There we go. And we we have one thing which is unused file pattern, find pattern and file. So we can implement that in in a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, take a break here. The uh, the last thing that I left off with was that we did find a a, a bug, right? We said uh oh, unused file pattern because we didn't finish our command line tool. So let's go ahead and finish our command line tool. So how would we do this? Notice that click here um, uh, has a group. So what that means is that this is a command that appears within the larger command line tool. So uh, what we can do here is actually add another group. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, and, and let's just say um, at, uh, we can say build a, uh, command that searches for a pattern puts the line number of the line. Perfect. That's exactly what I want. So here's the command, which is called find. And we're going to say argument will be file. And that's the pattern. And it's going to build this out. And so we can even ask it, look at this, it even was smart enough to know that I wanted some example documentation. And look, it's even going to print the line number and line using uh, a click uh, color. Uh, that's exactly what I was hoping it would do. <laughs> so it built it out for me. So so now if I do a make lint or make refactor, everything's been been passed now because it, we, we actually have something. So let, let's look for this. Look, if I say inside of this particular location, um, let, let's go ahead and find path lib. There we go. For online four, we found path lib. And if I want to put in something else like you know file like what happens if i say file uh there we go and look it, it's able to actually find every single line where the word file appears so kind of a cool little tool actually that that's very unique that 
was was co-developed with AI and and with me right and what what I could do is um, I, I could also kind of structure this a little bit so that um, we we uh, we add some additional uh, functionality to it so what what I could do is actually say like I did before is um, is uh, let, let's add a count as well so count the number of times a pattern is found and uh, we, we can we can actually do that and we can say um, right here would be um, counts we could increment that count plus equals one and then at the end we, we could say print the number of times a pattern uh, and we could say a different click color different click color there we go and let's go ahead and print this out perfect and now if we run that same command nine matches and it shows us each of the lines so I mean I might even use this tool <laughs> it's a, pre a pretty pretty neat little little tool here now what else can we do well we should look at the tests let's make sure that the tests work and now we do have one problem inside of our, our test tool here we say assertion that um, we were looking for the pattern dot find the the asterisk dot py because the um, this is kind of a bad search I think is the issue so I, I could probably fix that by going to our test file tools and um, I don't think we want to look for 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 that particular um, pattern uh, asterisk dot py because we're or, or we don't want to look for a count because we're going to be actively working inside of this directory but we could say that one of the files that appears should be hello right that we could do that so we just need to tweak our test a little bit to to be a little smarter there we go and now if i do make tests uh now the file file tool cli list the files well now in this case see this is a dumb test we would say we would just need to, to tweak that a little bit and say assert that um there we go we we we, we would just say like does one of these things that that is already there exist in in any of the paths it was it was a hard-coded test uh test file tools file tool cli oh but it's excluding test so we we would want to actually do this we just have to tweak our test a little bit here right because we're ignoring i believe test right so that wouldn't that was actually a bad a, a bad unit test there we go got it fixed so if i say get status we can go through here get add file tools adding working tests perfect okay got this working and now we can move on to the um containerizing things a little bit and, and i think the, the the thing to consider when you're when you're thinking about um, containerizing your application is to to think about how uh, a container actually works and what are some of the advantages of containers uh, and the, the the core advantage with a container really is that reproducibility right and so what we're going to do here is we're going to um, create a container uh, locally here uh, that uses a docker file so let's go ahead and do that so we'll say docker file like that and once we go to docker file uh, we we would just need to decide how how we want to actually build out uh, a container so that we could we could lint it and decide what it is that we actually want to want to put inside of the particular container so those are those are some of the the key action items uh, i think to start with one of the things that we could do is to build out a um a fast api type uh container uh, which would probably be a good place to start. And so what I could do is I could look at a project that I already have set up here. 
if I go through, I believe it was um, fast DPI from zero. So I have a, I have a repository here where I've, where I've done some containerized stuff. And so, and if I look at this repository, do I also have some keys in here too? Let's see. Um, secrets, code spaces. Now I have, I have no secrets or anything inside of here, but basically this, this fast API from zero rep repository, you can look at the structure that it has. It has a Docker file here, which is pretty simple Docker file. And then it also has a um, main.py file, which has our, our logic in, in, in inside of here. So what I can do is actually build this uh, exact structure out inside of this re repository. So I'm going to leave this here as like a guide and I'm going to I'm going to start to build a, a containerized application. So first I'm going to grab this containerized code and we can go inside of here and we can paste it in and let's take a look at it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want to use the the author of fast APIs um, base container and then I'm going to have a working directory which is slash code and I'm going to copy whatever is in my current working directory. I'm going to copy that into the container. And then I'm going to actually run the requirements file. And then I'm going to go ahead and run a, a application. So that's that's really all I need to do to get this to work. And then I also need to build out a main.py file. So what I'm going to do is create that real quick. So we'll call this main.py. Uh, and we're going to need to build some logic out uh, that will be a little bit different uh, than the logic we have because some of this is okay, but it's not going to really make a lot of sense for uh, a microservice. And, and so we'll need to build some smarter, smarter things out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy some ideas from this other repo here and uh, check them in. So I'm going to say what, one of the things I did before was I was using uh, these two tools, which I'll explain in a second uh, if I go back here. So one of the tools is called um, Yake, which basically is a keyword extractor. And the other one is Wikipedia. And so I'm gonna go ahead and install this. So say make install, perfect. And then once this is installed, the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm gonna actually import this, or, or I'm gonna get the right version number. So I'm gonna say um, pip freeze, and I'm gonna say grep Wikipedia, and I'm gonna just throw this inside right here, like that. There you go, Wikipedia equal equal 1.4.0, perfect. And then uh, the, the only other thing I need to do is now use both of these tools. So this one will pull Wikipedia web pages, and this one will actually do keyword extraction. So again, I need to use my library, and I need to build uh, a new tool. So we'll call this, um, uh, we'll, we'll call this, uh, how about research? my lib research.py, basically, perfect. And so I can say um, uh, from, uh, or import Wikipedia, import Wikipedia. And then we can also say from Yake, import keyword extractor. So these are, these are two things that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna, I'm gonna use. So the first thing, maybe I'll comment this out for a second. I'm going to say, um, uh, you know, search, uh, build build a search for um, Wikipedia pages. And so, what we can do is we can actually return back a search term that that uh, will return back a list of of pages that we could potentially query. And so, if I again use IPython here, I can start to interrogate. Uh, what's happening. So I can say from uh, my lib 
dot uh, research uh, imports um, search Wikipedia and and then if I say search if I say term would be let's say like uh, Barack and, and I can say search Wikipedia and I can say term now that was not exactly what I was looking for because this searches for a term and returns the summary of the of the page but what I want to do is actually build out the I want to find a search for all of the possible pages first right and so this is not exactly what I wanted so let's 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 change this we'll say uh, uh, retrieve build a function that retrieves a list of possible pages of possible pages from Wikipedia search term there we go we want to do a search term that's what I that's what I want so I'll go back here Brock and we say uh, get wiki pages And then I can say um, get wiki pages and we can say term. There you go. Perfect. So I'm able to actually get a list of different um, w web pages. And that's exactly what I would like. And now I'm going to build another one which says um, build a function that retrieves the summary of a Wikipedia page, which is what I had before. That's perfect. And then what I want to do is I want to get one that um, that actually retrieves the content uh, of a page from Wikipedia. Great. And then I want to build a function that actually uh, will find the keywords. And then we can say build a function. And that's where Yake will come in handy. And so I need to look at the, the Yake website real quick to just double check that I understand how it works. So if I go to this, I go to GitHub. Let's look at this person's um, uh, website real quick and see this is a keyword extractor, yet another keyword extractor, unsupervised approach for automatic keyword extraction using text. That's a lightweight unsupervised keyword extraction method. It, 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 and if I look at this, we can, we can see this. We can say import yake text like this and we can see keyword extractor for keyword and keywords and then what it's going to do it's going to return back something like this perfect right google kaggle etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and it'll give us a, a ranking and the the lower the score the more relevant the the keyword is and so that looks pretty pretty straightforward right again i just say yay keyword extractor so um if I go back to this, we can say build uh, search or uh, return the keywords, the, the top 10 keywords from the content of a page. There we go. Here's the page. And, and we say uh, get Wikipedia page, right, which is the function I wrote earlier. Uh, here's the extractor and uh, keyword extract, extract content. And we, and we, and we, we actually have that um working so now in theory all i would need to do is reload this and actually look through uh do an import and find get wiki keywords and we can say keywords is equal to get wiki keywords and we can pass in um the the page here like that there we go so we're going to find barack obama's page and there we go keywords perfect so it now found the the top 10 uh keywords uh for for this particular search now we could probably clean this up a little bit and um, maybe like return it back, uh, you know, 
maybe maybe actually even without the the similarity scores because maybe that's uh, distracting uh and so we could say return the top 10 content from a page and and we could put like um re return back uh you know like let's say like return return a dictionary a dictionary of the top 10 keywords um and and we, and we and we can do that so we can just ask our tool to tweak this that's a little bit better i think uh this is a little bit too nested because a list of tuples maybe is not exactly what i want and uh if i go back here we can just say uh this keywords and we say keywords, keywords. There you go. We have a we have a list of keys. We have a list of values. List of keys. You have a list of values. Keys values. So perfect, um, perfect uh, setup here for for me to then later uh, pull this into some kind of a, a an API or, or or tool. And now what I would what I would do next before I even build a container, everything is I would build out. A command line companion for this library and so let's make another one called we'll call this uh wiki research like this and then and then next up what i'll what i'll do is i'll say from uh well first i'll say import click like that and then i'll say from uh my my lib dot wiki um but my lib research imports and we probably want to import i would say the majority of what we put in here get wiki pages would be one of the things i want to import uh let's close that so we can we can say that we also want to get wiki summary get wiki keywords get wiki summary get wiki keywords and also get wiki content um, perfect and then and then from here i'm going to say uh, build a click group so we'll say build so i need to prompt it build a click group group here we go a command line interface for wikipedia research and then the first one would be uh, returns possible pages so we're going to call this first one search here and this will be the the search term and uh, search for search wikipedia for a term for page and pages Re return back the page and we can again tell it like um you know use click colors There we go, right? And now I also can invoke it very easily by doing the um, the you know call click call click. There we go, right? So the prompting w with Copilot is really a, a helpful tip to just kind of go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and have it like prompt you to to build stuff out. And then um, what we can do next here is um is actually chamad this so we'll say chamad plus x wiki research and then we can also go through here and say user user bin env python perfect and now if we go through this and we say wiki research help a command line interface for wikipedia research search the wiki wikipedia for a term and we say Wikipedia here, and we could put in the term that we want to search for. So again, I'll say Barack here, and it says no such term. Oh, we, because we need to say, we want to say search. There we go, there we go. So it found all the different web pages. 
now the we, we should also add some better documentation for this as well just like I did before we can say example um, you know uh, dot slash wiki research search Python uh, that looks pretty good let's try that search Python there you go right we we're able to find the, these pages so, so now I need to just build out the um, uh, the the other terms as well and so let's uh, build another uh, we, we, we could say retrieves the summary of a page so we would just say at click summary page summary page get the summary of a page click dot echo and uh, we can also say uh, return to highlight the page there we go let's just make it colored as well <clears throat> and, and what we could do is um is we could even add a little bit of smarts potentially in it as well like we could say like um you know count the number of uh characters in the summary uh and we could say use click highlight to do this and so we, we we can again kind of lean on our, our our superpowers here to 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 do this. So we can say page uh, here summary get wiki wiki summary page, and we can say this has this many uh, characters, and we say page click style page click echo. There we go. That looks pretty good. Summary summary. And so if I go through here and I say um, Python, for example, Python programming language, and we say, um, or actually, let's just do this one. Let's just do that one. Uh, page ID does not match any IDs. Summary, we, we may need to do, wait. We may need to do a search first. So let's search for Python. Ah, because I didn't put, I think because I didn't put uppercase. Um, I think it needs to be uppercase. There we go. So, and then summary uppercase. Well, let's just fix this. This is what's tripping me up. Go through here, we'll, we'll, we'll fix this. And we'll say wiki research summary, do that. There we go, the reticulated, so Python has 693 characters, the reticulated Python, right? So it has this good stuff here. So we can we can say um, that, uh, has this many characters looks pretty yeah that's that's good enough the 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 we can say wikipedia page wikipedia page has foreground something like that Wikipedia Python uh, and we could even put in like page put in some kind of a bracket kind of make it a little bit easier to stand out Wikipedia page summary there we go right so so we have we have a nice little little tool here so so the idea here is just to to get the command line tool to instrument out the ideas for what I would then put into the microservice. So this is pretty good. This is this is pretty good. The only thing left to do is to get the keywords. So now let's build a, a keyword tool. So we'll say build uh, a click that re build a click command that re that uh, that finds the the keywords the keywords of a page. That's exactly what I care about. The argument page 
and uh, get the top 10 keywords of a page and use click to highlight. Yeah, perfect. This is, I think, exactly what I want, uh, which is which is pretty cool. So now I'm going to do this. I'm going to run this tool, and hopefully it will just give me all of the, the keywords. There we go. And it returned back the keywords as now we could we could make this a little bit um, um, a little bit cleaner to print out, which is that um, uh, say like you know print uh, print the keywords the top ten keywords line by line uh, without the score. Um, and in a different color. There we go. We can do this. Top 10 keywords for Python. Oh, for Wikipedia page, for keyword and keywords. We would say that looks correct, I think, is this. And we can say um, print use. And we can just change this up. There we go. And we can do this one yellow. Let's try that out. Top 10 keywords for Wikipedia page um, uh, Python. Reticulated Python, Python, reticulated large reticulated Python. Anyway, so we got we got something that's that's pretty 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 decent, and and now I actually can build out a microservice next. So that's containerized. So we'll say make lint. Everything working. What do we have here? Redefine summary from outer scope. Instead of here, so we have twenty nine. We need to fix. Um. Did I redefine summary from out of scope? I keywords as well for 46. Um, I think we don't care about these for, for now because these are false positives. And I can just say um, pilot disable uh, those bugs. Now, unused import we do care about. Get wiki content, yeah. So we didn't we didn't end up getting that, so we're fine with that. And I'm just gonna say make lint uh, redefined summary. I don't know if I need I, I need that one, um, but but we can say we can just throw this there, and we can throw this there for now maybe i care about that in the future but for now i don't make format there we go so so i've i've got a tool that proved that i can build it now it's time to go to docker and what i would do next is that i would um potentially build a build an app here so if i look at this what is it what is it looking for so it's main.app so i'm gonna i'm gonna rename well, this one, there's nothing in it actually, because this is my command line tool, but I just need to build the logic out here. And so I can steal some ideas from my other project here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take some boilerplate code and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out some ideas and put them inside of here. So uh, and I can even clean this up a little bit. Let's just grab this whole thing. And uh, and uh, I'll throw this into the main. And we can clean some stuff out that I don't care about here. So the first thing is I don't want to add numbers. We don't care about that. We don't want this here. And um, this keyword looks interesting. The page looks interesting. The Wikipedia search looks interesting. And uh, the Hello Fast API looks interesting. So uh, I'm going to import fast api i'm going to use this base model so i can pass things into our command line tool and then the other thing i'm going to need to do is do the same thing that my command line tool did here and so this 
this is where uh, it, it would be important to actually build out a, a structure uh, that's that's similar. So I could just literally copy this because this is the same thing that I'm going to do. And that's why a command line tool is a great uh, first step in building out a microservice. So now that I've got that, I just go through here and I say from my lib.research import, get Wikipedia names, get wiki summary, get wiki keywords. And uh, I can actually build this uh, directly into a, um, an API. And so here is a class that is actually the thing that I'm gonna use when I do a JSON post. And so when I do a search here, I would just say, look, I want to look for a a, a a a search right here, which is which would have a name, and this looks uh, correct. I want to look for a page that would be a page, and I want to look for 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 keywords. Now the 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 page here, um, I think I will need to to change this. Get a get a summary. We'll change this. We'll say instead of. Uh, uh, well, we we can we can leave it to see, get a get a summary summary page. There you go from Wikipedia. That looks good. And so return. So what we would care about would be get wiki summary would be here. So for the page, we would just need to swap this out. Get wiki summary, and then for the search, we would say. Um, this would be pages yeah get wikipedia pages like that and then for the keywords we would say get wiki keywords like this get wiki keywords so this will be a post request so it, so basically the user will need to put a json object in there so that's pretty should be pretty good and now i can just run it locally first to test it and so I can just say python main.py and see if it works. Well, looks like it's working. Now, one of the really awesome things about GitHub is that it should wake up a, um, yeah, there we go. It wakes up a, um, like a application uh, preview tool that lets me actually prototype what's happening inside of my environment, which is, you know, actually pretty amazing. So if I click on this, we can see that in fact, it does open up a preview. There we go, a uh, fast API. And what I can do is I can navigate to the docs page and this will give me the, um, the, the documentation for the, 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 the web service that I build out. And this one is actually fast API, um, post, page, keywords. And if we, if we go through here, I can actually now start to use my tool. So I can say, let's go ahead and try this. We'll try it out. We'll say name, and we can say, in this case, um, uh, Barack again, and let's go ahead and uh, execute the search. There we go. Here's a curl command. There's there's the curl. If we look at the, the results, it, it is showing me that all the, the possible web pages. Now, if I go to Barack Obama, and we go back to here, um, we, we can actually look for the keywords. And so in this particular scenario, we can say, try it out. We, we can actually say, uh, search, uh, Barack Obama. So we can, we can put this inside and we say, look, I want to find all the keywords for the page, Barack Obama. What can you give me? There we go. And we, and it gives us back all of the keywords with the ranking, right? So it's, it's going to give us the, the ranking, the lower the score, the better that are, that are possible matches for this particular page. So we have a pretty cool little web service here that we can actually uh, containerize now. So that's the next step is we got it running as a, uh, as a microservice. We, we, we first prototyped it out with a command line tool, but can we build it out into a container next? Okay, well, how would we do this? We just stop this and then we need to actually build out the, the proper sequence of events to, to run this. And so uh, what we need to do is, um, is go here and we'll say like build, you know, part three, build containerized 
microservice, the, the technique that we're going to care about would be step one would be to um, build the container. Step two would be to run the container, right? So to, to build it, all we would need to do is I can, again, kind of follow my instructions before, which I have from this other repo. Why, 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 why and reinvent the wheel. In fact, I'll even talk about it as well, what it is that we're building. What we're building is uh, a GitHub repo like this. In fact, why well, don't even steal these docs? That looks even better. And I'll put this into my docs. I'll say, you know, like, there we go. In fact, I'll even be lazy and uh, use the exact same um, markdown, right? And we'll just put this in there. We'll say, uh, in fact, why don't we just, why don't I just copy all this even, even better? Let's just say this, And then I'll just throw this, I'll throw all this stuff right there. There we go. So it's it probably probably will be will be close. I might have to clean it up a little bit. But what is it, what does it give me? Yeah, it looks looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Yeah. So so basically, yeah, it, it looks like it built this out here, but but essentially, it's going to uh, give me the ability to to use this uh, uh, project use all my logic that I built out and then have web services. And then what, what, we'll, what we'll do after we use this Docker file is then move into a containerized continuous delivery, right? Which is really the end goal of DevOps is to build a containerized continuous delivery. So the, the commands then are, are pretty straightforward to run as the first thing we use is this. We say Docker build, and we build out this container locally in our environments. So let's go ahead and get this this thing working. And this is why having a powerful machine uh, that's a cloud-based machine is pretty cool because it allows you to to play around with uh, with with everything that you're building uh, without having to wait too long. Looks like it's working successfully. And once this is built, the next step would be to find the image that was actually built. And here we go. Let's go ahead and build this out. Perfect. And so in this case, look, here's our image right there. So this particular image, what we would do is we would just say Docker run. And then we go and we say image, image ID. Perfect. And if we run it, there we go. Now we see it's the exact same experience that we had before. And uh, whoops, go go back here. It's it's the exact same experience that I had before. And in fact, in this case though, it's just containerized. Everything is working the exact same way. Again, if we say I don't know Python, right? We find the the the, the reptile Python and we go through here and we say execute perfect Python programming language. And then from here, uh, you can also see that, look, it's putting the, the output in my, in my foreground. So I, I have a really good debugging environment by, by using containerized workflow inside of, uh, this, uh, GitHub, uh, code space. And so finally, uh, the, the next step for, for me to do would be to uh, go up and, um, you know, essentially add some kind of linting for this as well. So how would we lint a, a Docker file? Well, one of the ways that you could do this is we could add a, a step here that says lint. So we could say, you know, um, lint, or we could say container lint. And I believe, look, there, we, we actually... I, I, the code wrote itself basically, which is if I do this, if Docker is present, it will actually lint this Docker file for me. So basically if I say make 
container lints. It's going to pull in the latest thing and look, there's no problems with the container. So we have no, we have no issues with it. So I can even add a linting step uh, directly for, for the container itself. So really we're, we're, we're set and we're ready to go here for the final move, which is to, to get this deployed automatically into a production based environment. So let's, let's go ahead and do this. We'll say, get add, add all this in, get commit adding in uh, working containerized microservice microservice perfect good go we're, we're set and, and and now uh the next step would be if i go back to this uh this repo and we refresh it is double check, make sure that the continuous integration is passing. Now, we can also add another step though. If we go to actions, notice how it's using the, the GitHub code spaces pre-builds. We can actually click on that. <clears throat> and look, we can also add, there's a, um, I believe a badge for this. Where is the badge? For some reason, I'm not, it, it used to be here. Uh, not that big of a deal if I can't can't find it, but basically there there is a section somewhere where you can actually add um, the badge for, for pre-builds. Let, let, me, let me look one more time here. And if I say edit view, so we can see all the runs, like this has been building this environment. So not only am I testing the code, but I'm also building this particular environment. Yeah, and I thought that there was some kind of a badge here. Oh, there we go. It was just kind of hidden, create status badge. And I can just um, go through here, copy this, and, and we can show how sophisticated we are. Not only am I testing my, my code, although it looks like I ran into a bug here, I, I'm also testing the, the environment itself, right? So this is really a kind of a dream next generation DevOps uh, environment now why is it failing let's let's check it what did I blow up so oh the lint no modeling base model and model py, pydantic no modeling base model in mod, module pydantic uh, no model maybe I didn't import pydantic uh, Let's let's Google that. And no bottle, no reproduction. Oh, you can just do this. Okay, so I believe. Oh, or you can do this. That's that's another way to do it. Um, is we could say, we could whitelist it. If I look at my other project that I had before, um, let's see here. If I look at uh, my other my other fast API project, fast API from zero. I think I did do that in my my pylint. We can look at the lint. Aha, there we go. I just need to add that. So I'm going to add that in, into my PyLint. And so this is why we do continuous integration. It's, it, it gives us th these kinds of tools. And so I just put this in. And I should have ran it locally before I committed it. And so I just say make Lint. And does Linting work? There we go. So, so now I just add this in, get status, get add, make file, get commit, adding, make file. Make file. Get pull. Get pull. Perfect. And we say get push. All right. So so now that I've got that, this should trigger it again. And then we should have actually working continuous integration. So the next step then that I'm going to do 
uh, and this is a good place for a break again so we can we can walk over this so the idea is once you've got the continuous integration you have your environment set up you have a close proximity to what production is then it's time to move things into production right so this is the final phase of what we're going to cover continuous integration and continuous delivery and in particular a, a few of the things that we can we can cover here include uh, building a new based a cloud-based environment if necessary we don't have to we could do it within GitHub code spaces alone. Uh, but I wanted to show some of the things you can do with AWS. You can also go through and develop uh, back and forth with GitHub. And then the, you'll trigger a new build here that will actually uh, deploy something by building a container to the Amazon's uh, Elastic Container Registry, which will then trigger App Runner, which will then deploy our application. So. Uh, in order to do this, it's actually a pretty straightforward process. The first thing that I would recommend would be to go to uh, a Cloud9 based environment. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new Cloud9 based environment. And we'll call this um, Fast API. And uh, if you are going to build containers, I think it is a pretty good idea to to actually get a fairly reasonably big instance if your company has access to it. In this case, I'll, I'll pick one that's got some pretty good RAM. And this just makes things go a little bit quicker. And it takes, let's say 10, 20 seconds or so to, to launch an in, to an environment. The other thing that I'm gonna pay attention to that I'll add a link to is that it's usually a good idea to to actually slightly resize your environments. And so here's a good command here that uh, I can run and I can just take this command once this thing is woken up and it'll resize my environment in case I needed to work with, you know, bigger containers, for example, which sometimes can be the issue is you run out of space and it's, it's and it's annoying. Uh, you know, it's 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 optional for, for the project you're on, but I'll go ahead and show how you could uh, briefly do this. So uh, inside of here, if I wanted to, to take my disk space here and say df-h, we can see that there is uh, not a lot available. So depending on what it is I'm doing, so what I could do is I could just run this command that uh, calls out to a, a gist and it just resizes it to a, uh, to a, bigger, a bigger size here. <clears throat> and then if I now go back and I look at this, we can see that I've got 55 gigs free. So, right, so I've resized this environment, made it a little bit bigger. Let's talk a little bit about what Cloud9 is. It's really similar in some sense to GitHub Code Spaces with the change that it's AWS centric. And so what that means is if we go over to this section over here and we look at AWS, notice that it's got similar tools. In fact, they actually have a tool called Code Whisper, which is um, in development in beta that's similar to Copilot that will also help you build tools. So we can see the future is definitely gonna be these AI assistants that help us build out code. And if I look at the Explorer here, we can see lots of different uh, things that we can play around with, including, for example, ECR. So if I wanna create a new re container registry, which I will want to do, We'll, we'll do it from here. If I wanna play around with step functions, uh, I could right click and I could create a new step function right from here. I could also invoke previous step functions as well um, and, and, and even pull them down. So like here's one that I if I wanted to actually render it out, I could actually pull some other function that I had step functions uh, workflow that I, that I used earlier. So there's a lot of tooling inside of here that's specifically designed to help you build build things. And even App Runner, I can even create a service directly inside of here, and it'll actually ask me whether I wanna to point to the Elastic Container Registries, right? So there's some very, very tight integration here. So the, the first step for us to do is, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to create a virtual environment uh, inside of here. So I'm gonna say uh, Python 3-m, V E N V, and then I'm going to source this inside of my bash RC file. So we'll, we'll just um, vim bash RC, 
and I'll just add a, a step at the bottom here that says uh, source tilde dash venv bin activate. There we go. Perfect. So this this is now ready to go. Perfect. And we have a, a virtual environment uh, environment ready to go here. And now I'm going to clone this repo. And I'm going to go through here and I'm going to go to code, go to local, go to SSH section right here. And we can say get clone. And notice that it said, uh oh, we have problems. We can't get it because I need to add SSH keys. So I'll type in SSH key gen, add those keys, and then I just need to pass those keys over to GitHub. That's it. There's just one, one little step here to do to get this hooked up. And I can just grab this public key and I can just paste it into my uh, GitHub account. And if I go to uh, GitHub, we can go to your our, our settings here, and then I could just go to SSH and GPG keys and just make one. And we'll call this uh, Cloud9. C9 is, is pretty good. And I have to authenticate, right? So we have all kinds of auth, authing I have to do here, which is gonna do all right, so we, we got that we got that working, and now that I've got that hooked up, I should be able to to do the clone. There we go. So so we can do that. We can basically do the same steps that I did before here, right? And in fact, I, if I just cd into this uh, project, you can see the code is right here, the main file. There we go. And if I want to, I can just run it. I can just say Python main.py. Uh oh, it says no module. So w what do I need to do? Well, because I've already set up a make file, it's trivial. In fact, I could even just do this. I could just say make all. And this will install everything, test it, lint it. Just basically like, hey, is everything okay in my project? And we're gonna we're gonna try it out. And in fact, we did see one problem, which shows us that that was probably a bad idea to put uh, <laughs> IPython in a project. We actually don't even need IPython, so I'm gonna just delete that out of here, and I'm gonna say make all again. Uh, and there we go, we're, we're installing all the packages. Perfect. So we were able to get everything working just with one command, which is pretty amazing. And and even flush out a, a small little bug, which is I don't need IPython to deploy a microservice. So if I say get status and I say get uh, star, we say adding microservice and we say get uh, um and, and if I want to, I could I could configure all that, but I'm 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 not gonna get into all that. I'm just gonna push it. Okay, so we, we push those changes, and if I want to run it again, Python main, it'll actually run in foreground mode, and this will allow me to actually preview it. So if I click on preview, we can even preview the running application. Look, there we go. We got it right here. So so a, a fairly good uh, development environment as well, right? So I could go through here and play around with the application and do queries and all, all the things uh, and, and get this feedback loop. So it's not a bad environment to 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 develop in. Uh, and really the only other things that we need to do now are hook up the pieces. So let's look at the diagram again and see what we're gonna build. So if I go back here, what we wanna do is we want to, we have this set up first, we have this communicating, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to set up an ECR here to make sure that we can actually communicate and push this container uh, to that environment. And so how could we do this? Well, we could use our AWS tool 
right? We could just toggle this and we could go to ECR, which is the container registry, right click on it, say create repository. And from here, uh, what this will allow us to do is actually uh, create a repository uh, for this deploy. So we, we can call this CD fast and I'm going to say return and now it created this this repo and now um, now that I've got this look it even can can even let me right click and create an app runner server so we'll get we'll get back to this but the first thing that I want to do is that uh, I, I want to actually communicate with this repository so what I'm going to I'm going to do is I'm actually going to to open up uh, a console here so I'm going to go to uh, console and I'm going to go over to ECR here we go elastic container registry and I'm going to find the thing I just created which is this and I'm going to look at the push commands so these push commands are the magic that allows me to communicate with the container registry a repository and so if I copy this we can go here and I can just run them one by one there we go there's our first step and uh, that works. The next thing that I'll do is I'm going to do a Docker build uh, locally right here. So it's going to do a tag called, called CD fast, right? Because I'm going to tag it for this repository. And again, this is why the larger the machine you have, in some sense, the better if you're building containers, just because it'll, it'll be very fast. Uh, in this case, we're not doing anything too tricky, so it should be pretty straightforward. So it's going to use the official um, container uh, from FastAPI. Pull this all together. There we go. And now next, all I need to do is I need to uh, tag this image so that we can push it to the repo. We're going to tag it with uh, the proper tag, and then we're going to run this push command. So we'll go ahead and run this push command, and this will go through here and push it. Perfect. So what's great about this is that this push command will allow us to then hook into ECR. Uh, I'm sorry, into App Runner to to do our to do our deployment. Now, while it's pushing. Uh, one of the other things I'll mention is that we could now add a step here um, that is actually the, the deploy step, right? We, we've been waiting for this. So the deploy step is actually pretty easy uh, because we just need to rebuild the container. And in fact, if we go if we go here, uh, this is actually where it's going to push that 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 um, that tag. And if I go and if I go back to this and I refresh, there we go. We see that this has actually been put there. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to say view push command. I'm going to grab these commands and I'm going to put them into this particular um, uh, section. So I'm going to say, uh, in fact, I'll just change this. And I'll say uh, deploy. Deploy is only pushing to ECR. And we just put this one in first. That's the first uh, command. And then we just put those other three commands in as well. So we copy this one there. And then we copy the next one, which is here. And then we copy the final one, which is here. And we can actually uh, push this container to uh, as, the, as, the, as part of the deployment process. And so in the future, when I want to make a change, I just say make deploy and it'll, it'll go through and it'll build this out. Now, the only other thing I need to do now, now that it's pushed into the container registry, is remember this says ECR says, do you want to do a deploy? Well, we can. We just right click and we say create app runner service. Let's do it. And it's going to say enter a port for the new service. Um, sure, we'll, we'll say 8080, right? Because we know it's running on 8080. Um, configuration, we don't care about that. Um, select a role to pull we'll just say ecr access role a name for your service we'll call this cd fast and then 
it, it's going to ask us to select the instance configuration. We'll, we'll use the default. We'll just use an easy one. And that's it. And now it's going to go through there and it's actually going to create this, um, this app runner service for us. There we go. Look, it's creating the service automatically behind the scenes for us, which is which is pretty pretty cool. And if I if I right click on it, I can even look at the logs and see exactly what's happening in the logs right here. So we can see the operation is in pr progress. Or I could I could even copy the the ARN for this service. So I've actually got very very deep integration inside of this environment, with where I don't even have to leave it to work with it but since we do have access to the environment here um, what i'm going to do is i'm going to go over to ecr real quick and uh I, i'm sorry go to app runner and i'm going to look at the service itself look there we go cd fast is right here this is our service and in fact it's already uh ready ready to go here and and we can see the operation is, is uh in the in the process of deploying to uh, CD fast. Now, a couple things to look at as well would be that we should look at the settings for this. I don't, I don't know if it gave me the option to do continuous delivery. Um, but, but one of the things that we can do is configuration is we can say, here's our source. Oh, look, see, it says deployment is manual. So, um, I don't know if there's an easy way to change this I think maybe afterwards it might let me edit this because what I want to do is I want to set up uh, continuous uh, deployment and I'll show you how you how we would do this. So if I go to services and I say create new service, I can also do it manually. I can say container registry. I can grab whatever container I want in this case CD fast or whatever. And then if I want to, I can select this automatic, which is which is key because app runner would listen to ecr and just basically wait for something to happen and then and then pull that out automatically and then allow us to actually do a deployment of that particular service and so what that would mean uh, is that uh, it would it would directly correspond with this workflow which is that every time a container is pushed inside of ecr we could actually go through here and do an auto deploy of this app runner service. The only thing we haven't set up though yet is the code build, which is the deploy process. And we can actually use code build or we could use GitHub actions to do that as well if we have the API keys. But uh, I think it's gonna be easier to start with to use, um, to, to, to start this out with uh, code build. So again, you can just kind of kick around the tires here watch the service creation, refresh it, see what's going on with the logs, uh, look at metrics, look at observability, you know, pl play around with things while it's, while it's actually getting built. What, what is nice though about uh, the, um, the, the, the service itself is how it has such tight integration with, with AWS. And so you can see every single thing here that you, that you need. Also keep in mind that this is an encrypted URL HTTPS right here. And so when it is ready to be deployed uh, and it's in a production environment, it's essentially a completely secure and production quality service that is that is that is ready for you to 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 use. Now we can see that the operation is in progress. The service creation uh, it was finished. It, it now pulled the image from ECR and then it's going to provision the instance and deploy it. Uh, deploy that image. Now, this would be deploying the containerized uh, application into a service that can run the container. So behind the scenes, Amazon has a container management service, I think probably EC, ECS, I, I believe is probably what they're using. And that ECS would then be running it. And once it's deployed, it does a health check that looks at port 8080 to make sure that the service is in fact responding. Once it's finally responding, then uh, it, it, it will wake up here. So it's pretty close. And we can also, if we want to, look at the logs in CloudWatch if we wanted to. Uh, if we go to CloudWatch, you can look at the raw logs in, in more detail. And operation in progress, service status created. There we go. So 
what was great about this health check successful routing traffic so it looks like it's 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 been successful because it passed the the health check here we can even start to look at some of the metrics as well you know essentially how many times it's been hit uh, observability would be tracing if we wanted to turn on tracing uh, and then finally once it's i think once it's fully live i believe i can change this to 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 um automatic but but we'll have to just give it a second to wake up oh there we go it's awake it's awake now and so now if i want to test it out in production what do i do well i can just uh go through here and just type in docs and this is in fact running in an encrypted uh https url i can look at different things inside of here and uh search for it now this looks like the wrong service actually let's let's um that's not the service i was looking for i want to i want to go to this one yeah this is the service i care about there we go and we go to docs and now what's interesting use a library to get a random fruit well keywords here's the keyword search but basically uh this is this is it in a nutshell and if i go through here and i, I execute it we can see all the the different re results here now what do i do what do i do next to 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 get this this service um fully working well i could i could actually test out whether i could change so it looks like i can change it um so look this i i pointed to the wrong directory that it pulled an image from a location that I actually didn't want it to pull it from. I want to pull it from there. I have CD fast API and CD fast. So that I want to do this one, CD fast. So I, so I could, if I wanted to change that, but I also could change it to automatic. So you afterwards, you can actually do that and you can say use existing role and we can change it. So now it's going to update the service behind the scenes. And it should run the actual container that I had before. It, there, it was just picking a different container. But the last step, though, to get the full continuous delivery process set up here again is that we need to set up code build. And this will push the, the new build automatically, which will then trigger the continuous delivery. So in order to do that, what I need to do is I need to toggle over to code build. So I'm going to go over to code build. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say create a new build project. There we go. And our build project will be uh, app runner uh, continuous delivery. And we'll say this is this project is continuous delivery of a fast API service. All right. And we're going to build a build badge. We're also going to pick uh, the source here, which is in this case uh, could either be uh, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitHub Enterprise, no source. We're going to pick GitHub. And what you want to do is actually have authentication set up to your to your GitHub organization. Once you've got that set up, then it can actually pull those files out and push those files uh, directly into a environment. And so let's go ahead and watch this thing. Perfect, so um, if I scroll down and I go through here and I say, no, I look for this particular environment, it was uh, DevOps. So we'll go ahead and pick uh, DevOps, DEV. DevOps skills with GitHub, that's the one I want. And if I needed to, I could do other things like pull in sub modules, th those kinds of things. Um, but in this particular environment, I'm gonna say I wanna rebuild every time a change is pushed to a repository. And um, what I also wanna do is I wanna tell it what kind of image to, to use. And so the image is important because the the closer or even identical it is 
to the environment I'm developing in, the less problems I'm gonna have. So in this case, I would wanna pick Amazon Linux too. And we would also wanna pick the latest version, which I believe would be this. And one other key thing to be aware of is that because we are gonna be building containers, we do wanna say enable this flag if you wanna build Docker images or you want the builds to get elevated privileges. So we do want to build Docker images. And then this is another step here that could really be a problem for people is that you want to make sure that you use a service role that actually has the ability to uh, push things to ECR, right? And so <clears throat> you, you most likely will need to create a new service role. And so that would be something you would set up an IAM. Let's go ahead and show you how to do that. If I click a link here, you would need to go over to your IAM service and you would wanna to go to roles. And under roles, uh, what you would wanna do is go ahead and uh, create a new role. And you would say, I wanna create a, a service and you could put in here uh, code build uh, right here, this service. <clears throat> and then uh, you it would ask you a bunch of questions like, what permissions do you want to give to this? Now, again, it would have to have the permissions to actually push to ECR. And so you could, you know, look through and look through some default commission uh, permissions here. There we go. Code build, base policy, you know, app runner, like whatever it is you need to add for this particular service, you, you would add those permissions and then you would give it that role. Now, I already have one built, so I'm not going to create another role. And so if I, if I just go through here, we can... We can look at one um, that I that I used recently, which is um, probably the demo right here. And then the other step that is important to pay attention to is that you need to have a build spec YAML file or the build commands. Now, what, what's interesting about this is this really does highlight and look, you can even switch to an editor, right? And you could even type in your commands right here. But this really highlights why a make file is so helpful is that because I already did the hard work up front, and if I go back here and look, I have this make file, and let's just make sure I pushed it, checked it in. If I say git status and I add this make file, say adding uh, make file. Notice that all I have to do is say, get all, and it will install my packages. It'll lint my packages. It'll test my packages. It'll format my packages. And it'll deploy my packages. Each of these steps is exactly what, what it is that uh, is, is necessary for doing the deployment uh, to, to production. Uh, and it's just one command. And in order to put this into a config, I would just need to have a build spec.yaml file. Now I've already built one, so I'm gonna grab one from the, the repo that I had set up earlier here. Let's go ahead and look at this. We'll look at um, fast API from zero, fast. This is the one I want. And I'm gonna look at a build spec I have right here. So look at how easy the build spec is there's there's only six lines in the build spec and uh, all i need to do is uh, put paste this in there so uh, i'm going to go back to my aws environment here and i'm going to say touch build spec .yml, and i'm going to go to the file explorer and i'm going to grab that build spec yaml file just like this now i'm going to paste it in Perfect. And so this build spec, it leverages all of the work I just did over the last uh, few hours of building things step by step and, and putting it all together. And I just run one command, which says make all, which does the deployment uh, automatically for me, test my code, lints my code. And so this is essentially what continuous delivery is. So now I would just go to the, here. I said get add build spec. Go ahead and commit this adding build spec and go ahead and uh, push. Perfect, we've got this pushed. And if I go to my um, code build service, 
I would just do this. So it's a use a build spec file. So this stores the build commands in a YAML formatted build spec file. You could even rename it if you wanted to, or you know, put it in a subdirectory if you had lots of different um, you know builds. Uh, and then the other thing we can do here is just say create build project. Now, what we are going to do is if I, I think there's a build badge here, if I remember correctly, I just want to make sure I checked it. Um, yeah, enable build badge. So that's, that's the last thing I wanted to check. And so I'm going to go ahead and say create build project. There we go. So now it's been created. And what's cool about this is that any change now that I push will trigger a new deploy of my of my microservice, my containerized microservice. So first, let's double check if I go to App Runner, we can see that in fact I did make the change. Look, we can see that I changed the um, the container registry to a new container registry, and if I click on this link, uh, I can actually double check that the service is is different. Yeah, there we go. So this is the the, the container that I built earlier. Search page keywords, and we can actually um, search for something again. We'll just search for Python. What are all the web pages that are available via Python? Let's execute it. There we go. And now if I type in, if I take Python and I just take this and I put it into keywords, we can we can try it out like that. Try it out and uh, Python execute. Uh, and now this one did have an error, which is interesting. Um, and so we could even look at why that was returning a, an error. Now, I am curious if I just put this into, I might have might, might have been a typo or uh, maybe I have a space. Is that a space? No, Python. Let, let's try it. Let's see if it'll get the page. Does that work? Huh. So it's got it's got some some kind of an error, although this this, endpoint seems to work but how, how can we de debug our error pretty easy is i would just go back here look at the logs these are the these are the event logs but there's also application logs which we can actually click on right here and look there we go we see all the application logs and it says ah uh, okay so so we have we have something where 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 our um our code needs to handle a condition that we didn't that we didn't handle perfectly which is which is fine um and but but in general the the service is working and we can debug it and redeploy it and fix it the the, the main takeaway though is that um i've got a really good interface here for dealing with my microservice now the next step would be uh you know can we actually make a change to the service well we can and all I need to do is actually go here and we could actually to make this change right inside of here. We can say hello fast API uh, and I could say with uh, continuous delivery. Right. And what this will do is it would allow us to test whether our, our whole pipeline works because this message should appear if I do continuous delivery. So what I'll do next here is I'll say get status. We'll go ahead and get add this. We'll commit and we'll call this triggering continuous delivery. And we'll push this change. Okay, now let's go to code build. What's gonna happen is this will trigger the code build and it did. Right, so now we can look at it in action and we can see line by line what it's gonna do. And we already know what it's gonna do. It's gonna, it's gonna go through here and take the code. It's gonna run a make install command. It's gonna run a, a make lint command. It's gonna do a make format command. And then it's gonna push the latest built container into the container registry. And that container registry will then in turn be able to trigger the, the app runner build. So really, this is uh, the amazing part about continuous delivery. And again, we can look at um, the, uh, the the diagram again here. So we, we're inside the environment. 
we actually have this two-way communication. We push this change to GitHub. Once GitHub is aware of it, it then is able to go through and push that change directly into uh, code build. Code build will then uh, trigger a build, which will then push, push this change into ECR. ECR will then uh, trigger a new build with AppRunner and then AppRunner, which will then in turn be able to deploy via uh, via fast api so it's it's really like a like a domino like the dominoes get get triggered and so we can watch this in action here if we just trigger this that oh there we go look we we're able to download the source code now this one look we see an error here the yaml file is located here download failed wrong number of container tags expected one so we do have some kind of a we have some kind of a, a of a of a problem here, and so we we need to fix that, which should be wrong number of container tags expected one. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know why it's giving me that error, but but we can fix it. We can say build spec. Maybe the formatting is off or something. Let's, let, oh, I didn't look. I didn't save it. That's why. <laughs> there, there's nothing. I didn't. I, I forgot to save, and so we can just do it again. Add. We, we can say get, add build spec, and we can say get commit, and get uh, put. Now before I I push though, let's let's double check. So if I go to this, we should see a build spec file here that's empty, or no build spec was was it empty yeah so there's empty that's why it didn't it didn't work which, which in a way was pretty good evidence that you need it there we go we pushed it if i refresh now we, now we have the the command now if i go back to code build it'll it'll trigger build number two which is again the whole point of um of uh of continuous delivery is you can incrementally make changes constantly be making improvement uh, the you know the word for this is kaizen. So if I click on this, we, we've got the progress. We can also tail the logs, and we'll see the same thing. So again, we'll, if we if we go back to our our, um, our our diagram here, we can see this is what it is we're we're, we're doing is we're we're building uh, a continuous feedback loop that's constantly helping make make improvements, and because they're all chained together. It's, it's a quality control pipeline. So the more changes I make, in some sense, the, the better the ecosystem is because it's able to improve on what it is that, that I've actually built. And here we go. Aha, we got it working. We're able to do a, a Git clone. We got the clone uh, successful. The next step would be to, uh, to, to then uh, get into the linting and the formatting, and we'll see this in just a second. And once this is, once this pushes the the um, the build, here we go. Pylint is working, uh, which is good. The formatting is good. Now it's going to push the container to ECR, and uh, oh, so we had one other issue that th this particular role. Uh, so this is a perfect example. It, the role I picked, I just randomly picked some role that I thought would work. It didn't have the right privileges. So now, again, this is the whole point of continuous integration is you, you fix it. So how can we fix this? Well, we would just, um, we, we could just build a role. So I'm going to go into, um, into this service real quick, go to IAM, and, and we can actually just build a new role real quick. And in this case, if it is a role that's uh, for prototyping, I like to use admin role. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do uh, a prototyping role, which should be code build here. And then we're going to say next, I want to pick admin. So, so we, we, we basically, uh, to, to, double, to troubleshoot this, uh, I'm going to pick something that has administrator access to AWS, which you typically want to be very careful with, but for prototyping, it's okay. 
and we'll call this um, October 32022. Um, and, and then we put in um, code build admin like that. And this, this is a, you know, we can say admin, admin code build. There we go. And we just say create role. That's it. Now that now that's created, what I can do is I can actually go back to the settings of this project, uh, the build project, and I could say project configuration, and we could just tweak it. And um, we don't, it's not gonna be that section, additional configuration. It's gonna be, we're, we're gonna go to build details. It's gonna be this one, the environment. And we can just swap out this service role right here for the new service role, which is the one I just built, which is October. 3 2022 update environments this policy was not attached to a role code build admin did i not attach that to code build admin i thought i did attach that to code build admin um view the role It should, yeah, it should have been. Maybe, maybe I didn't. Let, let's try one more time. Let's just, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll delete that one. We'll try one more time. We'll, we'll go here. We'll delete that. We'll say to confirm, delete. Let's let's double check that I did attach it. I should, it should have attached to, the, to that role, but we'll create it one more time. Create a role. We'll, we'll say code build. Code build. So these are the things that always take a little bit of time for, maybe I forgot to select that, I don't, I don't know. So there we go, code build, that's the one I want. If I type in admin, let's see if this works. Admin, administrator access, that's what I want. And we'll call this oath, how about 2022 admin. And this looks like, yeah, it is attached to code build, right? That should that should be, in fact, the service. Maybe the um, the the role takes a second to to wake up here. Uh, let's delete this, and we'll call this two zero two two code build. Yeah, look, this does look like this should work. Update environments. Yeah, I don't know why this is saying the policy was not attached to this, but what I can do is just start over real quick. And we can say build project and just try it again. We'll just say like build, build. Well, we can delete the other one just so it's not, um, it, it's not failing. So we can just say delete this and we can make a new one. Sometimes I find it, if you do get into some weird bug, you just rebuild it uh, and it's easy. We'll just call like deploy, build, make a badge, go through here, Pick GitHub, go to repo, um, pick pick the repo that we care about. We want to rebuild every time. Okay, there we go. And we can just say, no key. And we can say, um, what is the one we care about, which is the DevOps skills. There we go. That looks good, that looks good. Pick the latest stuff, pick the latest stuff, pick the latest stuff, pick this, and then we wanna say existing service role, and we wanna say 2002 admin. We want to use a build, use a build spec.yaml file and uh, say create build projects. And, and, and now we can just start the build manually, and let's just double check that, that it will work. Now, whether whether it, it'll, it'll take a second to to trigger this again, um, but in, in, in a nutshell, once this is done, again, what we, what we do here is we, we're able to actually uh, do our continuous delivery 
uh, process uh, in a in nutshell. Like sometimes there's little fine details here that are that are important to to watch. But let let's let's see if we can get this thing working here for the the final leg here. Typically, the thing that takes the most troubleshooting in a system is the back and forth with the build system and the permissions. And, and they're just the nature of how things work. A lot of times, setting up things with continue, with uh, infrastructure as code can help solve that because they can help troubleshoot a little bit of the the kind of back and forth. But here we go. We say running make file. Hopefully, the build uh, role now has been fixed. We'll, we'll find out very shortly. There we go. It's able to install the packages looking good and here's the the moment of truth here i think pretty soon does does our does our build system have the privileges to push a change up oh, it does look like it does there we go so it's pushing this change here the the um and let's 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 see if it's able to successfully do this. So it was able to do the installation, the linting, the testing. There we go. We're actually going through, we're pulling the latest changes from the official Fast API um, base and then uh, fixing them with our code or, or adding to them a new layer to it. And then let's see here, does it does it allow us to, to push those changes to to our ECR. Aha, look at this, successful, right? So this is why automation is so important. And in fact, I can go here and I can go to my build and I could look at the badge, copy badge URL, and I could just go back to my project and I could even put in the badge. And, and I, f I always forget, I don't know why they make it so hard f to do the badge. like. But I think you have to do something like, like this. You have to say like this, and we and, we, and you have to name it uh, something meaningful like uh, code build. There we go. So once this is done, then I could hopefully get a, a three badges, like I'm a Boy Scout. There we go. <laughs> badge, badge, badge. We have all the badges. This one, I don't know what's going on with it. We'd have to fix it. But now if I go back to Fast API server or app runner, look, it triggered the build because of the fact that I pushed a new container into the container registry. So really this is the win here uh, of doing this uh, of doing this process. And in fact, it's now gonna deploy the, the new change for us. And the moment of truth will be when we go to this service and, and we look at um, once it's been Look, here we go, operation in progress, is will it take the change that I made earlier and, and show us that change, right? That's really gonna be the, again, the, the, the kind of moment of truth here. So we can see here that operation in progress is set. We could even look at how long it would typically take. So it looks like it takes about two and a half to three minutes from the, the point of service status is set to operation for it to actually pull an image. So it depends on probably the size of the image that it's gonna pull from the container registry. Uh, and once it's done that, it takes a couple more minutes for the health check. So it's a probably all in, it looks like it takes about five minutes for it to do a deployment. And I, I think probably cleaning up the size of the image might be able to, to shrink that a little bit. Um, but but five minutes isn't 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 awful to to do this, and so since this triggered at uh, eleven fifty, it should be due pretty soon to say successfully pulled the image from ECR, and so the message that we're looking to find, if we're successful here, is we want to find this message in in the payload. We want to say hello fast API with continuous delivery. ECR, and so we just need to 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 watch that service, which is right here. And so let's go ahead and there we go. Health check, 
it looks like it's ready to go here or it should be close aha there we go that's the is that the right one cd fasts latest cd fast latest i guess it's still still deploying so um i don't know if it keeps the old version around because look that's see that's the old message and so that's a good question though is is it does it leave the old one i think it does i think it leaves the old one up until finally the new one is fully flushed out and then it just swaps it out which is which is kind of a cool uh deployment process actually if that really is the case